welcome back students now in this series of gynecological oncology let's discuss about the ovarian tumors now ovarian tumors can be benign in nature or they can be malignant in nature now let's see what are the differences between a benign ovarian tumors and malignant ovarian tumors see benign ovarian tumors they are going to be mostly seen in a reproductive age group women but on the contrary the malignant ovarian tumors they are going to be seen in extremes of ages that means like they can be seen in a pre pubertal age group and post menopausal women so what does i mean by see if there is a tumor in a reproductive age group women that tumor can most likely be benign tumor if there is a ovarian mass in a post menopausal woman and that mass can be mostly malignant in nature okay see anyway exceptions are there see these are certain guidelines kind of thing okay these are not the gold gold standard points okay now see these benign masses are usually unilocular and cystic in nature but if it's a malignant tumor if it's a malignant mass then mostly it is solid in consistency with multiple septa if you see on my top whatever you are seeing is a cancer it's a serous cystadenoma it's not serous cystadenoma it's a serous cystadenocarcinoma of the ovary where you can see a thick septa where you can see a thick septa so because of this thick septa you can see it's a multi loculated there are many many locules inside which there is a solid growth so what i am trying to put into your mind is usually malignant masses are solid in consistency with a thick septa inside them and they are solid tumors okay now and also you can see these papillary excrescences or papillary outgrowths on the surface see you can have all these this kind of papillary outgrowths which are coming out so these are papillary excrescences and that too they are mainly associated with the malignant ovarian tumors now if it's a benign tumor mostly the, they will involve a single ovary what does i mean by unilocular involvement if it is a benign mass unilocular involvement will be there if it's a malignant mass both the ovaries will be affected okay so malignant tumors are ovarian cancers cancers will have bilateral involvement benign tumors will have unilateral involvement okay so everything is clear now let's discuss about the risk factors for ovarian cancer guys what and all i'm going to discuss right now this 15 they are causing they are predisposing a female for developing this ovarian cancer there are 15 risk factors but let's discuss the main important risk factors guys it's very simple that more the ovary is functioning more the ovary is getting stimulated more number of ovulations more the ovary is under the stress more number of ovulations more stress in the ovary more working ovary is under more stress so what i am trying to put into your mind if ovary is under so much stress then that ovary can develop this cancers so all is risk factors somehow make the ovary keeps the ovary under the stress let's see early menarche and late menopause start with the early menarche what does it mean by early menarche early menarche it's very simple here the female is starting her menstrual cycle in a very much younger age for example she is supposed to start her menstrual cycle by 15 years of age or 14 years of age what if she have started her menstrual cycles by 8 years of age or 10 years of age 14 10 so four extra years of menstrual cycles four extra years of this ovarian function if four extra years of this ovulation is happening so ovary is working for four extra years so ovary may got stressed out and it may gone crazy and it can produce the ovarian cancer the same way same concept is applicable to late menopause she is supposed to have a, her menopause by 50 years of age what if she is having her menopause at 58 years of age she is having eight extra years of ovarian function eight extra years of ovulation so ovulation all this stuff is very much hectic for the ovary and ovary gone crazy and she have developed the ovarian cancer 
okay now obesity is a risk factor okay obesity is a risk factor for many things okay here also now endometriosis see we have already seen the endometriosis which is associated with a hyper estrogenic state see when we are discussing about the endometriosis when we are discussing the topic about endometriosis there we have discussed that these endometrial deposits are going to fall on to the uh, ovaries and may cause endometroid ovarian cancer see the endometriosis is associated with endometroid ovarian cancer later we will discuss that and it is also associated with the clear cell cancer of the ovary so endometriosis is a risk factor nulli parity or infertility is also a risk factor why why because if she is nulli paris means she is not having the pregnancy if she would have her pregnancy what will happen having pregnancy is something good why because she will get almost one and half years break okay one and a half years break from the menstrual cycles because of gestational amenorrhea and lactational amenorrhea she is not going to have her menstrual cycles for one and a half year that's something good but if she is nulliparous or she is infertile means she is not having pregnancy she is not having a break from the menstrual cycles so that keeps her ovaries continuously working continuous ovulation and that's not something good for the ovaries continuous stress is not good okay that's what i'm trying to put into your mind and this asbestos exposure asbestos is a carcinogenic agent which is thought to cause ovarian cancer and this asbestos in some quantity is also present in the talc okay in some quantity it's present in talc so keeping perineal talc some females they'll be keeping this perineal talc to keep they the vulval regions dry not to uh, get moist over there so keeping this perineal talc on daily basis so this perineal talc with this asbestosis will find its way into the blood circulation and this asbestos may reach the ovary and cause the ovarian cancer something true and genetic mutations genetic mutations will be seen in this lynch syndrome braca1 gene mutation braca2 gene mutation which we are going to say in the next slide see Lynch syndrome. What exactly is that? It's a it's a disorder where there is a mutation of DNA mismatch repair genes because of the mutation of certain genes, which are going to discuss later. Important genes are there because of the mutation of those genes. There is this development of ovarian cancer. See, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, which is also called as Lynch syndrome, is not only associated with the development of ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is a part of Lynch syndrome, but getting this lynch syndrome because of the mutation of certain genes will increase the risk of colorectal cancer that's the most common cancer which is seen with the lynch syndrome endometrial cancer ovarian cancer gastric cancer kidney cancer bladder cancer many cancers are seen as a part of lynch syndrome and we all know that braca1 gene mutation braca2 gene mutation which are associated with the development of ovarian cancers we have seen that and the anovulatory conditions like pcos and HRT, see the PCOS and HRT, they are the risk factor for endometrial cancer, but they are also thought to be a risk factor for ovarian cancers. Okay, now ovulation inducing drug. How a ovulation inducing drug can be a risk factor for ovarian cancer? Why not? In the name itself, it's very clear. Ovulation induction means it's stimulating the ovary so much to cause the ovulation. So this stimulation may make the ovary to go mad and ovary become cancer. Okay, so that's something important. And smoking, so smoking I will be discussing you again. But remember, smoking can also be a risk factor for ovarian cancer, especially mucinous histologies. Okay, when I am discussing about the different types of ovarian cancer, epithelial ovarian cancer, uh, germ cell cancer, stromal cancers, like metastatic cancers, there we will know what is this mucinous histology, which means simple. A tumor with mucin okay so we have completed the risk factors for ovarian cancer now let's go further now what is this Lynch syndrome Lynch syndrome it's an autosomal dominant disorder where there is mutation or where there is a mutation of DNA mismatch repair genes the most common mutation is MLH1 gene mutation okay MLH1 gene mutation and MSH2 gene mutation so because of the mutation of these genes the female can develop a multiple cancers in her body now what are what is the most common cancer the most common cancer is a colorectal cancer followed by endometrial cancer 
Next, the ovarian cancer. See, what you can see here, having Lynch syndrome, having Lynch syndrome increases the risk of getting this ovarian cancer by almost 20%. That's what I am trying to put into your mind. Okay. Okay. Now, let's talk about the BRCA1 gene mutations and BRCA2 gene, BRCA gene mutations. See, BRCA1 gene is present on chromosome number 17 and BRCA2 gene is present on chromosome number 13. See, it's very important that having BRCA1 gene mutation is having the maximum risk of getting the ovarian cancer by almost 40%. Okay. See, BRCA2 gene mutation also causes ovarian cancer, but only 15%. BRCA1 gene mutation, 40% chances that she will have ovarian cancer. So, this female who is having this BRCA1 gene mutation, she is at a risk of getting ovarian cancer by 40%. So, she is a high risk individual. So, what we have to do? We have to screen this female. Okay. We have to do the screening in this female. See, normally screening for ovarian cancer is not indicated. Why? Because ovarian cancers are rare cancers. But this female is a high risk female. She is having a risk of almost 40% for getting the ovarian cancer. So, what we have to do? We have to screen her. Okay. So, annual screening is done in these females who are having this BRCA1 gene mutation. So, first of all, how we will know that there is a female who is having this BRCA1 gene mutation? How means? If a female is having a first degree relative with ovarian cancer, okay, there is a female and her first degree relative like mother or sister, they are having ovarian cancer. Now, she is coming to the clinic and she said, like, you know, she is having some symptoms or like she came to the clinic for general routine examination and she said that, my mother or my sister died with this ovarian cancer. Now, just think about BRCA1 gene mutation. She might also have a BRCA1 gene mutation. Why? Because her first degree relative died with ovarian cancer because of BRCA1 gene mutations in them. So, now I am suspecting the same BRCA1 gene mutation may be present in this female so, what I will be doing, I am going to screen this female who is at a high risk. So, I am screening her. What I will be doing is, I am doing annual screening with transvaginal sonography and CA125 levels. We all know that CA125 levels, they are the tumor marker for the ovarian cancers. Now, let's see. If a first degree relative with the ovarian cancer or BRCA1 gene mutation is there, what is the risk of getting ovarian cancer? See, imagine that I am a female, that my mother is having this BRCA1 gene mutation and she is having this ovarian cancer. Now, what is the risk of me getting that BRCA1 gene mutation and ovarian cancer? How much percent is? It will be somewhere around 2 to 10 percent. There is a risk. Okay. So, 2 to 10 percent chances are there if a first degree relative is having this ovarian cancer. Okay. But if I have, if I have BRCA1 gene mutation means then me developing ovarian cancer, 40% risk. Okay. Okay. Well and good. So now what I will do? There is a female who is having this BRCA1 gene mutation. Now she is in front of me. And what I will be doing is, I will ask her, see, you are having 40% risk of getting this ovarian cancer because you are having this BRCA1 gene mutation. Now, what I have to suggest her is, the moment you complete your family, okay, the moment you complete your family, better go with the total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, okay. So, the moment she completes her family, it's better to remove her ovaries because she is having a more risk of developing this ovarian cancer. So, what I will be doing is, as there is a high risk of almost 40%, I will be doing total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salping or ophrectomy once her family is completed. So, this is very, very important. Now, BRCA2 gene mutation. See, these BRCA2 gene mutations are also associated with the development of ovarian cancers, but less, only 15%. And we have already seen that the BRCA gene is present on the chromosome number 13. Now, one important point is, See, you can have a ovarian cancer just sporadically, simple sporadic cancer or you can have ovarian cancer in the family that's a hereditary ovarian cancer because of a Lynch syndrome or BRCA1 gene mutation or BRCA2 gene mutation. 
Now my question is, see if it's a sporadic in nature, simple, you are having some risk factor and it, it simply came sporadic, okay, sporadic in onset. Then sporadic ovarian cancers in a female are going to be seen by 60 to 70 years of age, okay. So usually sporadic ovarian cancers present at 60 to 70 years of age, this is something important. But if it's because of hereditary reasons, it's a hereditary ovarian cancer, then the onset will be much earlier. It's not 60 or 70, much earlier. So it's going to be present by 50 years of age. Hereditary ovarian cancers present much earlier. Okay, so that's something very much important. After discussing the risk factors, let's now discuss about the protective factors. Now, what are the protective factors? See, nulli parity infertility, it's a risk factor. But protective factors are Multiparity, having lots and lots of children is something good. It's protective against ovarian cancer because too many children, too many breaks, too many breaks for the menstrual cycle, too many breaks for the ovaries. So ovaries are very much happy because they are not totally under the stress. Okay, they are simply relaxing, so they won't go mad. Okay, so multiparity is protective factor. Oral contraceptive pills, they are also protective factor. Why? Because we all know that combined estrogen progesterone pills, they are more progesterogenic in nature. It just creates a pseudo pregnancy state. Okay, pregnancy is something good for the ovarian cancers. Why? Because these oral contraceptive pills creates a pseudo pregnancy state. That's something good here. Now, why? Because taking oral contraceptive pills causes an ovulation, if there is no ovulation, that is something good. Why? Because the ovaries are not ovulating, they are not under the stress, they are simply relaxing. Good. Now, lactation is a protective factor. Why lactation is a protective factor? Why? Because if she is lactating, we all know that there will be lactational amenorrhea, break is there, ovaries can relax. Now, and certain surgeries like hysterectomy, salpingectomy and tubal ligation, these surgeries, they are protective because these surgeries having any of these surgeries is protective why because see it is thought to be the carcinogen spread for example just like a perineal tag which contain asbestosis see the carcinogens can find its way to the ovaries via the vulva vagina cervix uterus fallopian tubes and from there into the ovaries now if you remove this uterus Okay, you have removed the uterus or you have done the tubal ligation or you have removed the tubes. Now, having any of these surgeries will take out, will knock down the pathway or passage for the carcinogens. So, carcinogens are not getting a way to reach the ovaries. One of the ways is lost. So, these surgeries are thought to be a protective factor and also important. A physical exercise is also a very good protective factor because obesity is a risk factor. Exercise is a protective factor, simple opposite, okay. Now, after discussing this, let's discuss about different types of ovarian tumors. Now, we are going to discuss the different types of ovarian tumors. For that, whatever you are seeing in my background, that plays a very crucial role, okay, crucial role. Now, whatever you are seeing in my background, that's a cross-section of ovary, where you can see these epithelial cells, okay. So you can see these epithelial cells which are lining the ovary. Okay, these epithelial cells, whatever you are, whatever I am highlighting here, they are the epithelial cells lining the ovary. And what you are seeing here are the germ cells. And this in between the germ cells, whatever is having this all material or this all this area is a stroma. Why I am showing you all this anatomy here? Because you can have a tumor from the epithelial cell, from the epithelial cell, you can have a tumor. So, ovarian tumors are divided into epithelial ovarian tumors, germ cell ovarian tumors, stromal ovarian tumors. Okay, sex cord stromal ovarian tumors, we will discuss, don't worry. Now, how many major types of ovarian tumors are there, guys? Epithelial ovarian tumors, it's not a one single tumor, epithelial ovarian tumors, which includes so, 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 we will discuss, don't worry. Epithelial ovarian tumors, germ cell ovarian tumors, stromal ovarian tumors. Or a tumor may not be intrinsic or I can say a cancer may not be intrinsic 
it may come from some outside some other from outside and it may get lodged inside the ovaries and it can proliferate so metastatic tumors so how many types of ovarian tumors you may expect there will be epithelial ovarian cell tumors germ cell ovarian cell tumors stromal ovarian cell tumors and metastatic ovarian tumors now let's see the classification see i have already discussed here ovarian tumors they are epithelial in nature they can be epithelial in nature now what are the examples of epithelial ovarian tumors the examples are see serous tumors mucinous tumors brenner's tumor endometrial tumor and clear cell tumor guys this one slide is the heart for entire ovarian tumors if you know this slide entire ovarian tumors will be very very easy so you have to know this is the who classification for the ovarian tumors where the ovarian tumors are mainly classified into four types and which are having every type is having subtypes for example epithelial ovarian tumors are divided into serous ovarian tumor mucinous ovarian tumor endometrial tumor clear cell tumor and brenner tumor in the same way germ cell tumors are divided into teratomas dysgerminomas yolk sac tumors embryonal cancer choriocarcinoma and mixed type okay so this is very much important and we are going to discuss everything in detail okay we are going to discuss about one by one so now from where we have to start we have to st start from the epithelial ovarian tumors so without any delay let's start from the epithelial ovarian tumors now if i am saying epithelial ovarian tumors they are arising from the lining epithelium of the ovary so now we are going to start with the serous ovarian tumors and the mucinous ovarian tumors means we are going to see the differences in a one single table okay now in this slide what you are seeing is a serous ovarian tumor and mucinous ovarian tumor guys now i am saying serous ovarian tumor it's not a one single tumor serous ovarian tumors again can be malignant and again they can be benign so serous ovarian tumors you are having again two benign malignant so benign ones are called as serous cyst adenoma malignant ones are called as serous cyst adeno carcinoma in the same way mucinous tumors they can be benign they can be malignant if it is a benign we are going to call it as mucinous cyst adenoma why because it's a mucinous tumor mucinous cyst adenoma if it's benign if it is malignant it should be called as mucinous cyst adeno carcinoma okay so first of all why they are called as serous tumors or why they are called as a mucinous tumors they are called as serous tumors why because they are filled with serous fluid the cysts are filled with a serous clear fluid why they are called as a mucinous tumors why because they are filled with this a mucinous material okay the entire tumors the cysts are filled with the mucinous material whatever you are seeing over here in the down they are serous cyst adenoma okay which is a unilocular tumor which is filled with the you can see the cystic appearance right simple cystic appearance which is filled with a clear fluid serous fluid on my top what you are seeing is a mucinous cyst adenoma which is a multiloculated you can simply see there is a this septa which are present and these cysts which are which are filled with the mucinous material okay now ovarian involvement if it is a serous tumor okay if it is a serous tumor usually the serous tumors are bilateral in nature means both the sides you can have the serous tumor if it is a mucinous tumor they are usually unilateral mucinous tumors are unilateral in involvement serous tumors are usually bilateral in nature but a serous tumor can be unilateral as well as a mucinous tumor can be bilateral okay so please concentrate here that even mucinous tumors 10% of the time 10% of the time they can be bilateral in nature having said that see serous tumors are associated with certain mutation certain gene mutation and mucinous tumors are associated with certain gene mutation now what are the gene mutations which are seen with the serous tumors they are braca1 gene mutation braca2 gene mutation and p53 gene mutations can cause serous tumors and mucinous tumors are associated with the keras gene mutations now if i am talk about the tumor markers the tumor marker for a serous cystadenomas or serous tumors 
are CA125 for CA, like for both serous cystadenoma as well as CA, serous cystadenocarcinoma. Okay, I'm just talking about the serous tumors. CA carcinoembryonic antigen and CA199. Okay, so CA199 and carcinoembryonic antigen, they are the antigens for the mucinous tumors. Now, okay, so what is the gross appearance? I have already said you that the serous tumors grossly, they are unilocular tumors which are filled with a clear serous fluid. But on the contrary, the mucinous tumors, they are multilocular, okay, they are multilocular because they are having this septa in between, because of the presence of this septa in between, okay, they will just looks like a honeycomb. You know how honeycomb looks like. So, because of the presence of septa in the tumor, it looks like a honeycomb. Now, and they are filled with the mucinous material, there is no doubt. Now, what about the microscopic appearance? Guys, this is the one area where most likely the questions are being asked. Okay, this is the one place you, you can have a question, you can expect a question. So, these tumor cells on histopathology, okay, under the microscope, if it's a serous tumor, the epithelium, the epithelium, these are the epithelial cell tumor, the epithelium looks like a fallopian tube, okay, the microscopic appearance resembles a fallopian tube lining and that too under microscope you can see samoma body, serous cystadenomas, samoma bodies, what are the samoma bodies guys, the tumor cells which are surrounded by the calcium, okay, the calcium accumulation around the tumor cells, serous cystadenomas, true, but the mucinous tumors, the epithelium, it just resembles the endocervical lining. Okay, well and good. Now, smoking, is it a risk factor or not? Have we studied smoking as a risk factor in the previous slide? Let's just see here. See, here, the 15th one, intentionally I haven't discussed over there. See, smoking is a risk factor for ovarian cancer. Yes, but for mucinous histologies, what does I mean by mucinous histology? Which means the tumors which are having this mucin content or like no, the mucin is there or the mucinous fluids are there inside the tumor. These are the mucinous histology tumors. Now, here what we are discussing is a mucinous tumor now. So, for mucinous tumor, smoking is a risk factor. Very, very important. Okay, well and good. Now, one more important point is, see, these mucinous tumors, they are having this mucin inside them and they are growing at any moment this tumors may simply rupture and pour out all this mucin content into the peritoneum and that causes inflammation inside the peritoneum and abdominal cavity so that causes pseudomyxoma peritonei so what is meant by pseudomyxoma peritonei it's simple nothing but the mucus content that the whole like you know uh, this peritoneum it's getting inflamed okay it's getting inflamed and fibros because of this uh, mucin which is getting released extruded out of the ovarian tumor the ovarian tumor simply got ruptured and all this mucin came out okay so that's causing inflammation of the peritoneum and causing fibrosis of the peritoneum this is pseudomyxoma peritonei but important point is most common cause of pseudomyxoma peritonei is Appendix cancer. Cancer appendix is the most common cause of pseudomyxoma peritonei. And pseudomyxoma peritonei is also seen with mucinous tumors. So, what I want to put into your mind is the most common cause for the pseudomyxoma peritonei is not the mucinous ovarian tumors. The most common cause for pseudomyxoma peritonei is cancer appendix. And mucosal of appendix can also cause pseudomyxoma peritonei. So, having said that, let's see some important single liners. Okay. So, out of all the ovarian tumors, epithelial, germ cell, uh, sex cord, strobal tumors, metastatic tumors. Now, what are the most common tumors? See, this is the one point I forgot to mention earlier that epithelial ovarian tumors are the most common ovarian tumors. Out of all the ovarian tumors, Epithelial ovarian tumors are most common tumors. Almost 90% of the ovarian tumors are epithelial in nature. Epithelial ovarian tumors. Now, in epithelial ovarian tumors, what are the most common tumors? 
the most common tumors are serous tumors okay so please concentrate here guys the most common ovarian tumor is in epithelial ovarian tumors in op epithelial ovarian tumors the most common ovarian tumor is serous cyst adenoma which is benign in nature this one okay serous cyst adenoma is the most common followed by the most common ovarian cancer direct single line most common ovarian tumor serous cyst adenoma most common ovarian cancers are cyst adenocarcinoma okay so in a just wrap up i know i am repeating but it's very much important serous tumors benign serous cyst adenomas malignant serous cyst adenocarcinomas associated with braca1 gene mutation braca2 gene mutation and p53 gene mutation serous cyst adenomas they are having on histopathology they are having this somoma bodies okay and the tumor marker is ca125 but when i am talking about the mucinous tumors they are multi loculated with multiple septa which is giving a honeycomb appearance they are associated with pseudomyxoma peritonei because there is this mucin content inside them mucus content inside them okay so the epithelial lining resembles endocervix in the mucinous tumors but the serous tumors epithelial lining resembles fallopian tube or i can say in a simple way the tumor like you know these epithelial cells in this tumor they are simply resembling, resembling the fallopian tube okay now okay let's go further now guys we have completed we have completed the serous tumor mucinous tumor now let's discuss about the brenner tumor the moment i say brenner the first thing that's going to strike in my mind is a nest and a bus is popping out of it okay a nest and a bus why something like that see the moment i say brenner the bus is going to come into my mind bus b u s why with a nest why because this brenner tumor they are solid tumors okay brenner tumors are solid tumors and this brenner tumors they are 100% unilateral tumors okay 100% unilateral involvement solid tumors and these brenner tumors are encapsulated benign tumors okay so whatever you are seeing here so it's a solid inconsistency that tumor which you are seeing here it's a solid tumor and there is a capsule there is a capsule around this tumor it's encapsulated solid tumor 100% unilateral involvement b u s yes. okay so b9 b unilateral u and s yes. and it's having this rubbery consistency now why bus is coming to my mind bus because of b u s yes, as well as bus why why we use a bus for transportation trans t r a n s so trans for transportation for transitional epithelium so there in serous tumors we have clearly seen that the epithelial lining resembles a fallopian tube and the mucinous tumor the epithelial lining resembles the endocervix now here in brenner's tumor the cells they resemble transitional epithelium where in our body we have this transitional epithelium in the urinary bladder so there we are going to call it as a urothelium okay the lining epithelium of the urinary bladder is a urothelium it just they are similar okay so under the microscope it just looks like a urothelium that's what i'm trying to put in your mind so bus benign unilateral and solid in consistency and with a rubbery nature bus is used for transport trans trans for transitional epithelium okay so why this nest why this nest why because i repeatedly ask mcq if you are taking this tumor and if you are seeing under microscope you can see here on my top you can see like you know, that tumor cells they are just like you know uh, they are just in the form of nests okay you can see these uh, tumor cells they are arranged like you know concentrically just they are looking like a nest so they are called as walthard cell nest okay there is a cell nest okay cells they are arranging concentrically and they are just forming a nest of cells so these are walthard cell nest so walthard cell nest is seen with 
Brenner's tumors and if you see one single individual cell inside that cell you can see the nucleus which just looks like a coffee bean you can see a cell which is resembling a coffee bean so coffee bean nuclei is the same with Brenner's tumors but also remember that this coffee bean nuclei is not only seen with the Brenner's tumors but also seen with the granulosa cell tumors now what is this granulo granulosa cell tumor sir granulosa cell tumor is it is it a epithelial cell tumor or is it a germ cell tumor or is it a sex card stromal tumor now please concentrate so all this is to build up the concept granulosa cell tumor where is it see here it is there okay under sex card stromal tumors granulosa cell tumor is there so there also you can see this coffee bean nuclei and this Brenner tumor it's the most common cause of it's the most common cause of pseudomyxis syndrome it's not pseudomyxoma peritoneae pseudomyxoma peritoneae is something seen with mucinous tumors of the ovary pseudomyxoma peritoneae but this is pseudomyx syndrome see what is this pseudomyx syndrome see pseudomyx syndrome is due to fibroma ovary okay the most common cause of sorry not pseudomyx syndrome mix syndrome usually the mix syndrome mix syndrome is because of fibroma ovary where the like ovarian this ovarian fibroma is associated with ascites and pleural effusion usually the mix syndrome is because of fibroma ovary where the patient is going to have ascites as well as pleural effusion but my question is same here also with Brenner's tumor the patient is going to have the female is going to have ascites as well as pleural effusion which just looks like a mix syndrome but this is not because of fibroma ovary this is because of Brenner's tumor so now I am calling it as a pseudo mix syndrome so if it is because if these symptoms are because of fibroma ovary then you are going to call it as mix syndrome if the same symptoms are causing by some other tumor other than fibroma ovary then it should be called as pseudomyx syndrome not mix pseudomyx so most common cause of this pseudomyx syndrome is Brenner's tumor so we have discussed all the important points regarding serous tumors mucinous tumors and Brenner tumor after Brenner tumor let's continue with the two other tumors which are endometroid tumors and clear cell tumors are they part of epithelial cell cancers? Yes, please concentrate here. Uh, we have completed serous tumors, mucinous tumors, Brenner's is also completed. Now we are going to discuss about endometroid tumor and clear cell tumor. Now these are very simple. Now please concentrate that endometroid tumor and clear cell cancer, both of them, they are malignant tumors. Okay, they are malignant. Okay, they are mostly malignant in nature. Now, in the name itself, it's very clear. Endometroid tumor. So, it is associated with endometriosis, say associated with endometriosis and endometrial cancer. But, if they ask you in a single line question, most common ovarian tumor which is associated with endometrial cancer, then the better answer would be endometroid ovarian tumors. Endometroid ovarian tumors are mostly are most commonly associated with endometrial cancer. Then what about what is the ovarian tumor? What is the ovarian tumor? Most common ovarian tumor which is associated with endometriosis, not the endometrial cancer. If it is endometrial cancer, it is endometroid tumor. If they are asking you what is the ovarian tumor most commonly associated with endometriosis, please concentrate here associated with endometriosis most common ovarian tumor associated with the endometriosis the better answer will be clear cell tumor most common ovarian tumor associated with endometrial cancer endometroid tumors most common ovarian tumor associated with endometriosis the better answer will be clear cell tumor but also remember both this endo endometroid tumor and clear cell tumor they are both associated with endometriosis as well as endometrial cancer but most common something different okay so both are malignant in potential now this clear cell tumors they are associated with in vitro exposure to diethyl silvestrol okay taking this drug during pregnancy that can cause
nuclear cell tumors okay so in utero exposure to diethyl silvestrol can cause this ovarian tumors in the offspring now here on histopathology you can see hobnail cells and these hobnail cells can be seen in other places also we'll discuss don't worry when we are discussing about the germ cell tumors sex cord stromal tumors there we will discuss so here on histopath you can see hobnail cells and this Previous cell tumors are rarely, rarely associated with paraneoplastic hypercalcemia. Okay, they are associated with paraneoplastic hypercalcemia. Now, which tumors are associated with pseudomyxoma peritoneae? Mucinous tumors. There, I missed one point. Please concentrate. They are associated with pseudomyxoma peritoneae, leading to Severe hypoproteinemia. Why there is severe hypoproteinemia in these patients? Why? Because mucin. Mucin is nothing but protein, right? Mucin. So mucin is present in a place where it's not supposed to be present. Mucin is present wherever it's needed. Okay, wherever this mucosal lining or wherever this mucus is needed, there it should be present, not in the ovaries. So if all this mucus is getting concentrated in a place where it is not needed, so in the body where it is needed it is going down so it causes a hypoproteinemia see all this like no the ovaries got ruptured and all this mucin is getting poured into the abdomen where it's not needed it's in the third space so that's going to cause a hypoproteinemia in the patient so pseudomyxoma peritonea is associated with the ovarian uh, mucinous ovarian tumors which causes the hypoproteinemia in the patient okay guys we have completed all the epithelial cell tumors which include serous tumors mucinous tumors, Brenner's tumor, endometrioid tumor and clear cell tumor. In the next part, we are going to discuss about the sex cord stromal tumors as well as the germ cell tumors. Okay, the germ cell tumors and sex cord stromal tumors we are going to discuss in the part 2 of the video. Thank you.